this is a special series that we've set aside to ask, uh, to answer rather, some of your questions that you asked. So it's since you asked, and we're just taking some topics that many people ask constantly about, and we're just going to take them straight to God's Word and start to unpack them. Last week, we answered the question, how do I handle stress? And, and, and it really was an incredible to walk through and see that God has a plan for stress, and that we're able to, uh, to basically live that out and live, and in fact, a stress-free life. I know that's hard to believe, but the truth is it's available to us. So if you missed last week or you're still stressed out, I want you to go listen to that on podcast and, and, and begin to walk that out in your life. I want to see you, you know, alive and full of God's grace in your life when it comes to the stress. This week, though, is a doozy. This week is a common question, one that I get from a lot of people in a lot of different ways, and it's a big one. And, and so we're going to spend our whole time going through, I'm going to do it in about four other questions. I'm going to kind of look everything around it. But here's the core question. How do I recover from sexual mistakes? How do I recover from sexual mistakes? Let me ask you real quick, what is the most expensive mistake you've ever made? The most expensive mistake you've ever made. I, um, when, I, when I was a teenager, I worked summer camps consistently. And, and you may not know this, but in summer camps, um, there is kind of a pecking order. You know, high man on the totem pole, low man on the totem pole. And it comes from how you get transported around the camp. You know, so the low end of the totem pole is you walk everywhere. As you move up, you may graduate to a scooter or a bike, and then from there, you're really kind of seen as something special when you get to ride around on a golf cart. But the holy grail, the apex of all things that is a, ga- a camp, is a person who drives a four-wheeler. That, that is the, the kind of the, the central to it all, this ATV that they get to drive around. I spent years working at camp, and I walked everywhere. But there was one year that I had nagged enough and begged enough, they made me uh, capable and made me available to me to drive the ATV, the four-wheeler. I remember handing the keys in my hand, and and I was so excited, so I got on it, and I was pulling a trailer because we had to go load some stuff, and I remember as I drove through the camp, I wanted everybody to see that I had been upgraded on the pecking order, so I was beeping the horn. I'm waving like the queen. I mean, I'm doing everything I can to make sure folks are, are paying attention to me. What then happened, though, is I heard a terrible noise and felt a great jolt as I was trying to turn the corner and waving to all the folks, I had used the trailer I was pulling to pull off the whole fender of someone's brand new truck. Yeesh. So to say the least, here's the deal. I began walking again right after that. And, and I, but additionally, that is by far the most expensive mistake to rip off a whole side of a brand new truck was by far the most expensive mistake that I've made um, until you really start thinking about this area of our lives. Now, if you and I were to sit down and we were to have a private conversation, which, by the way, that's kind of how today's going to feel, like you and I just sitting across a table having coffee. Um, what you think, I think both of us would come to the conclusion of, the costliest mistakes in our lives often come from the most intimate places in our lives. The, the, the costliest mistakes that we have, I mean, so some mistakes are, you know, just money and time and energy, but the real ones, I mean, the ones that really cost you something often happen in this part of our lives, the sexual area of our lives. Here's the truth that that you, it may have cost you this mistake you've made. It might cost you regret, shame, could cost you your marriage, might even cost you your relationship with God. And so this is an important, important question for us to unpack. Is there recovery for it? Because it costs a whole lot when we find ourselves in it. Well, there's a couple things that I want to kind of lay a foundation with, and it's this. You know, today I want you to consider these realities that number one, everyone has made a mistake in this area of their life. Everyone. There is not a person in this room who hasn't looked at something, watched something, read something that they later regretted. Every person, I will be the first to admit, I've needed God's grace in this area in my life. And, and, and what I want you, why I want you to know that is this. That means we're going to focus on Jesus and not on judgment. You know, there's not going to be at this point where I say, you know, everybody that struggles with this, please come this way. And everybody that's like that, come this way. We're going to focus on Jesus and how his plan for our life can unveil and how we can really be recovered through his work at the cross. This isn't a place that you're going to find a lot of judgment when it comes to this area because we've all messed up here. Now, the second thing I'd want you to know is that if you don't make recovery a priority, you're going to continue to pay the price. 
You know, for a lot of people, they've tried to hide it, they've tried to bury it, they've tried to do everything they can, but if you don't make recovery a priority, you're going to keep paying the price. And so today, I'm going to talk to two groups of people. I'm going to talk to those of you who, who are struggling with past mistakes. Nothing, nothing's going on right now, but you're just struggling with past mistakes. Things like guilt and shame, condemnation, regret are just really affecting you, even though something happened a long time ago. I'm also going to talk to a group of people who are presently struggling. So it doesn't matter if you're haunted by your past or something happened this weekend, we're going we're gonna to cover all the bases that there's recovery for everyone when it comes to that. And, and, and I'm going to do it simply, as I told you, by answering four questions. Here's the first one. What is a sexual mistake? What is a sexual mistake? Well, you know, the, in today's culture, that's pretty unclear. That would be hard to answer because based on what society tells us, we have some answers. Based on what celebrities tell us, we have some answers. And based on even how we feel, we have some answers. You know, and, and what you're going to find is if your definition of a sexual mistake falls under one of those guidelines from culture or how you feel, you're going to find that that standard is very temporary. It tends to move around. It tends to, to kind of lead away from truth at times and come back to truth at times. And so it's not the best place to find what is a good standard for a sexual mistake. On the other hand, I believe that the New Testament is extremely clear on God's standard for, for sex. As a matter of fact, if you look at Jesus' words all the way through the, any of the apostles' writings, they just kind of have, they're all on the same page of what is God's standard for sex is. And what I've found is, is that when I stay within that standard, I live in blessing. But when I step outside of that standard, then I really start to see things unfold in my life. And so I, I want to take you through what is Jesus' standard. And just hear it straight from Jesus in Matthew 19. Jesus was kind of asked, hey, what's the standard for this, Jesus? And here's what he said. Haven't you read the scriptures? Jesus replied, they record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And he said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united as one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split them apart what God has joined together. Now, you probably heard some language like that at your wedding, but, you know, if you take that definition and really break it down and compare it to everything else written in the New Testament, here's what you're going to come up with. This is God's standard for sex, that inside of this circle is God's standard. A, one husband, one wife, committed to each other physically, emotionally, and spiritually. That's what you're going to find is God's standard. He says, hey, if you want to live a blessed life, you don't want to deal with any regret, you want to have the, just the absolute most uh, fulfillment and satisfaction, here's what you're going to find is to stay in this boundary. And that's what we have found in our lives is that people, as they move outside of this boundary, you find that satisfaction comes and goes. That, that, that they end up finding satisfaction for moments, but then they end up with a moment of, uh, with a lifetime of regret. But when you stay inside of this boundary, all of a sudden you start to realize that God does designed this, and he may know what's going on. He may actually realize how to make this work. So, so here's the short of it is, is that it, physically we get, yeah, okay, I get that. Emotionally as well, though, that if you're going to stay connected to God's standard and live under that, then you've got to emotionally stay connected to your, to your spouse and spiritually. And I'm going to explain those three if that, that's a little confusing to you in just a second. But here's the big picture I want you to get. Anything inside of this, you're going to find blessing. Anything outside of this, you're going to find eventual trouble. See, it, w as long as we stay inside of God's boundaries, we always find God's blessing. But outside of God's boundaries, in anything, but especially this, you're going to find trouble, regret, shame, mistakes, the reason we're even asking this question today. Now, I know for some of us, we immediately say, well, pastor, that's so restrictive. I mean, this is all we get. This is, I mean, this, this is the lines. I mean, that, that's it. Well, here's what I would tell you. Um, I, I want to ask you a, just a simple question. When you're driving down the street and you come to a place that says, do not enter or one way, do you have a moment where you say, this is really dampering my feelings? I mean, this is really putting down my desires. I have this desire to go down this one-way street, and this sign is really taking away what I want to have happen. That's probably not the way you feel about it, because you know that that sign is, is a good boundary. It's a warning to keep you from embarrassment and harm. 
And, and, and you realize that this is the exact same thing God's doing. In our, you see, God created sex. He's the one that understands best how it works. And therefore, if he created it, he knows best how it should be lived out. He knows that outside of this, that we live with regret and, and condemnation, guilt, and relationships break down. But he knows inside of this, we get the fullness of it. And, and so this is extremely important because you, you don't look at other things this way. You don't look at stop signs or one-way signs that way. So we got to understand, we have to look at that some Someone wiser, someone who knows more, has taken time to show us the boundaries with which this is best used. Now, here's the second thing you may be saying, though. Well, I don't care what it says. I'm going to do what I feel. And, and, and let me say to you, you're perfectly, you can do that. As a matter of fact, you, you know, you're not going to get anything from me that tells me that you don't have the choice to do that. You can live by the way you feel. You absolutely can. You can take and judge each relationship and interaction and moment based on what you think is a mistake and not. But here's what I want you to know, and this is just the truth of it. You can do that, but it will drastically affect your faith. Drastically. Say, so, well, why? How come? Because ultimately what you're saying is, is the way I feel is the ultimate authority in my life. The way that I feel, the way that I think, what my desires want, have greater insight than the Holy Spirit who go, who's kind of orchestrated this all. You're ultimately saying this, that you've replaced God in the standards he set, and you've set your own. Now, here's why that's a problem. The first commandment is, have no other gods before me. And when you do that, you, you do have another God before uh, your heavenly Father. You've made yourself God. When you live by your standards, your feelings, and your desires, you've taken him off the throne, and you've put yourself there. And so you, you're not going to succeed, uh, and you're not going to really be satisfied spiritually when that happens. Now, here's the second thing that I would want you to know, though. Why is it difficult to recover from sexual mistakes? I mean, why is it so difficult? It seems like other things I can get over, but this is something that lags on. I see it damage people. I see it just take down whole families. Well, let me ask you this. Are all sins the same in effect? Now, a lot of people would say yes. A lot of Christians would say, yeah, yeah there's no difference in a sexual sin and a lie. They're, they're, God sees them all the same. He doesn't like any of them. Well, th 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 that's not really true. Scripture teaches us that sexual sin is actually in a class all by itself. That it is, it is above, and that it's actually uh, damaging in a way that maybe you don't even realize. It, let me show it to you. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18. Run from sexual sin. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. See, it says no other sin. It says, compared to all the rest of them, some of them just affect one thing. here, But this one, it does major damage. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Now, I want you to see this, this term body that appears twice. That what he's talking about there is not just your physical body. That word, if you, you kind of looked at the definition, it means whole person, whole person. And here's what you have to understand. You're, when you're a whole person, you're not just a physical person. You have a spiritual being, that, that, and that's how you relate to God. You're an emotional being, which means that's how you relate to other people, and you're a physical being. The way God designed sex is it engages all three of those. That it engages spiritually, physically, and emotionally in our lives. So he's saying that, hey, there are some sins that are just physical, some sins that just you damaged emotionally. This one damages every bit of your life, all that who you are. Because God created sex to be the apex of a relationship, the, the top level, the most intimate part of a relationship. That's what he designed it to be. He, he designed it to be a permanent bonding between a husband and wife that, that, that he says, hey, nobody's supposed to pull that apart once God puts it together. Together because it intertwines you emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And so that's the reason that it's so difficult to recover is because when we step out of God's standard, we're really doing the maximum amount of damage to our lives. Not just our physical, not just our mental, not just our emotional or spiritual, but every level of our lives is damaged when we step out of God's standard for sex. As a matter of fact, you're not just damaging who you are, you're also damaging someone else. There is maximum devastation for sexual mistakes because it engages every part of who we are. Now, this is at the point where some people, maybe in their minds, they would say this. Well, that's why pornography is okay, because it's a victimless crime. That, that, that's why pornography is okay, because it doesn't affect anybody except for me, and I get to choose. But that's not true. As a matter of fact, pornography does a lot of damage that you may not realize. I'll give you a couple examples here. Pornography destroys intimacy. Sex is not about having a great time or an experience. It's about intimacy. It's about knowing someone physically, emotionally, and spiritually on every level. And when you look at, at pornography as a regular part of your life, it destroys intimacy. 
As a matter of fact, uh, most statistics prove that when a person regularly uses pornography, it increases the chances of marital infidelity by 300%. That means when you have a regular relationship with pornography, whether you're reading it, watching it, whatever, there's, you're, you're literally increasing the odds that you're going to have an affair or end up in divorce. Now, now, the reason that it destroys intimacy is because pornography is fake. It's all fake. And when you feed your soul a steady diet of fake, then you struggle to relate to what's real. It means that when your, your future spouse, your current spouse, you try to have an interaction, there is a difficult, you, you just don't know how because you have engaged in something that's fake and your body's used to eating fake and then now it's, it's going to struggle to connect with anything that's real. But not only that, look, look at this, pornography devalues another person. This is the one that I would get a lot of argument on because they say, no it doesn't, it's, just, it's, it's victimless, it's just, it's just me, and that's not true. You see, um, here's the ultimate definition kind of pornography is that you're taking another human and making them an object for your selfish use. Ultimately, that, that's what pornography is, is that you're taking a human, dehumanizing them, and using them as an object. They have no choice, they have no feelings for your selfish desires. But what you don't realize is that even though there's nobody in the room with you, that person has a name. That person has a story. That's a son or a daughter. That's that that person. Jesus died for them just like he died for you. You can't dehumanize them. That's a real person. And so you have to realize that that sexual sin is it's one of the hardest to recover from because it does so much damage to every part of it. That's why the scriptures are filled with warnings about it. It's why we work so hard to let the Holy Spirit work in our lives to lead us away because it does so much damage. Even today, if you were to kind of look across this room and people were able to share their story, there will be people who have been haunted by something that happened to them or they did to someone else or something. They've been haunted for years. There were, if you were able to tell the stories in this room, there are some people in this room that this weekend they did something and it, it, it happened this weekend, but they're still living with it today. And then they're struggling with it today. And, and, and some people would tell you, you know what, what started out as fun now enslaves me. I used to control it and now it controls me. And so this is very serious, but I, I want to I give you a promise that I believe by the end of the day we're all going to live out. Galatians 5.1, here it is. Christ has freed us. So, let, so that we may enjoy the benefits of freedom. Therefore, be firm in this freedom and don't become slaves again. He says, hey, no matter what you've done, what's went on in your life, what, what's happened in the past, what happened this weekend, you can be free from this. You can live in freedom. You can live with God's best in your life. It, it, you see, when we fall into sexual sin, it doesn't mean God doesn't love us. It just means that, that we're not getting God's best. And he says, I want you to have your best. So, so you're going to live in freedom. You're going to see the benefits of freedom. And ultimately, and this is what you want. If you've struggled with sexual mistakes at any length of time in your life, what you really want is not a moment of freedom. You want sustained freedom. And that's what he says, hey, you're going to get freedom, the benefit. You're going to get to enjoy it, and you're going to stay free. And so that's what I believe today God's going to give us is the ability to stay free, to experience freedom, and ultimately we get his best because no sin can separate us from his love, only his best. So here's the the third question. And remember, I told you I was going to hit into two groups of people. Here's the first group. How do I recover from my past mistakes? How do I recover from my past mistakes? There are some of you that that what is happening in your life is not the problem. It's what happened in your life is the problem. That you're struggling with with what happened to you or what you did to someone else. And every story is different. The details of all those stories are different. And we could get caught in the weeds. But here's what I ultimately believe you're asking. How do I deal with what remains from that mistake? How do I deal with the shame, the condemnation, the guilt? How do I deal with that? Ultimately, here's what we're asking. How do we really live forgiven? Not how can I become forgiven, but how do I live forgiven? Because it doesn't feel like I'm forgiven. I hear you say God forgives people. I hear you say that God doesn't keep record, but how do I live forgiven? I'm glad you asked. Here's Psalm 32.2. I love this scripture. It says, blessed is the person whom the Lord no longer accuses of sin. Let's just look at the first part of this verse. First of all, this word blessed means happy. It says, happy are people who ultimately God forgives their sin. That's what this is saying. The first part is saying, hey, happy are people that God forgives their sin. Now, the problem is, is that there are a lot of people who are forgiven. They get the first part of this verse, but they're missing the second part. Look, and who has no deceitful thoughts. 
That's a, so here's what he's saying. Being forgiven and realizing your forgiveness are two separate things. There are people who are forgiven but are not living like they're forgiven. That they are forgiven. Positionally, they're done. I mean, the moment that you came to God with any mistake, any sin, no matter how heinous, and said, God, I need you to forgive me, God forgave you. I mean, immediately, completely, there was no delay on it. You are forgiven. The problem is you don't realize it. The problem is you don't live like it. The problem is you're not owning the forgiveness you've been given. So he says, here's what's got on the problem. We got people happy or people who are forgiven by sin and their mind, their thinking no longer plagues them like they are not forgiven. Big difference. And so ultimately, here's what you kinda, you gotta, you're kind of ask is, how can I renew my mind? How can I get rid of this thinking that makes me feel like I'm not forgiven even though I can? Well, here's two things, and, and they're just real practical. If you're trying to live forgiven, you need to meditate on God's word. In life, the absence of God's word is alignment with the enemy's will. In, in life, absence of God's word is alignment with the enemy's will. I wish that I could tell you some different way, but here's just the truth. That if you don't have a regular relationship with God's word, you're going to continue to live in defeat. And it's not just that you say, well, I come on Sundays, that's not enough. You have to have a, God wants to speak to you, directly to you about your situation. He doesn't mean that you have to read 12 chapters or a whole book. He just wants you to have a regular relationship with his word because that's the main way he speaks with us. When you don't have a regular relationship with God's word, here's what's happening in your life. You're more influenced by what the enemy says than what God says about your life. Which is why you are forgiven, but you don't feel like it. You are forgiven, but you don't realize it. If I was you, I would leave here today, I would go home, I would Google forgiveness scriptures, I'd print off 10 of them, and every day I'd read them to myself. Because all of a sudden, I'm starting to change what I think, how I think, based on what God says to me, not based on what my feelings, what I think, and, and, and ultimately what the enemy is saying to me. You have to meditate on God's word. If you don't do it, I, I, I'm sorry, this just doesn't work. If you don't get a regular relationship with God's word, you're never going to feel like you're forgiven because you need to hear the voice of God and how he says your forgiveness is final and not how the enemy says it is. Now, here, here's the second thing I'd want you to do. Make it a part of your testimony. So many people don't feel forgiven because forgiveness ultimately is celebrated. Ultimately, forgiveness is about helping other people find forgiveness as well. That if you're just personally forgiven and you make it to heaven, God wanted that to happen. But you know what he really wants to do with your story? He wants to free you, set you free. He wants to build you up. And then he wants your story to help someone else. And so few people. That's why the scripture tells us that we overcome by what Jesus did on the cross and the word of our testimony. That, that because, so you need to make this a part of your testimony. You know what the difference between uh, your mistake giving you guilt or giving God glory is? How often you share it. That, that's really what it comes down to is you can live with guilt and your mistake will give you that or it can give God glory. The moment you share your story, God redeems what you regret. He, he takes what you regret and what was all messed up and he takes it immediately and flips it around to where it's helping you and helping other people. You just have to realize this and you have to, you, you know, people who struggle to do this, ultimately here's what their problem is. If you struggle to share what God's done in your life, it's because you're still trying to do it in your life. Like you're trying to live in your strength and not God's. But people who, who have come pretty far, they realize they wouldn't have made it without God. So they gladly, openly, freely share what God's done in their life because they know they couldn't do it. Ultimately, people who don't share, they don't want people to think different of them. They don't want people to understand what they've been through. It's a, it, the belly of it is pride. That ultimately, you're not sharing what God's done in your life because you're afraid of how people will think of you instead of the glory that they want to give God. So you have to make it a part of your testimony. For people who are struggling with your past, I, I want you to hear this if you don't hear anything else today. God is more interested in your future than your past. And that's just a statement of fact. I know that you think that God is so interested in your past and just wants to bring up all the things you've done wrong and he's just keeping this big That couldn't be further from the truth. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that when it comes to your past, once you've asked for forgiveness, he tosses it. He just separates it from you and his memory as far as the east is from the west. He actually tosses it in what he calls a sea of forgetfulness. He says, hey, I want you to get this. When it comes to forgiveness, what you did, I just throw it in the ocean, which means I could never find it again. 
again. What you remember, I don't remember because you're forgiven. I'm not interested in your past. I'm interested in taking your past and redeeming it for your future and for my glory. That's ultimately what God wants to convey to you today is that you don't have to live with the rear view mirror. You get to live with what God wants to do in your future. You just need to learn that. Remember, you're forgiven. You've just got to operate and, and own the forgiveness you've been given. Now, here, here's the second how do I recover, the second group of people, how do I recover from my present mistakes? So we, we've talked about past mistakes, but what about if today, Pastor Joe, I'm in it? Like it's happening in my life regularly. I can't break free from it, or I, maybe I didn't, I, I didn't understand God's plan, and I, don't, I, you know, I need to. How do I change where my present situation is? Well, I'm going to give you four things, four simple things. I'm talking about practical, because remember, we're sitting across from each other today, And what I would tell you is these are the exact same things I've told every person that I've ever had this conversation with. They're the things that bring recovery in your present situation with sexual mistakes. Here's the first one. Come clean. The first thing you have to do is come clean. It's so tempting to try to ease our conscience rather than cleanse our conscience. And and ultimately, that's what we, we try to do is we try to just get relief without having to share what's really going on in our lives. But you need to accept God's standard that I shared with you today. And you need to admit that you're not living in it. You've got to to share, you've got to just, you've got to accept it. That God has a standard and you're living outside of it. And you've got to admit that, hey, what you're doing, the choices you're making are not inside of God's boundaries for your life. And if you can't do that, ultimately what you're struggling with is pride. Again, pride is the belly of all sin. It's the underpinning that keeps all sin up in our lives. But when we come to God, when we say, God, this is what's going on in my life. I'm willing to come clean. I can't do this. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit starts to work in our lives. I'll show you. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6, he wrote this long list of all the detailed sins that we mess up with in this sexual area of our lives. He wrote down all kind of sexual mistakes. He was saying, hey, some of you do this, some of you do that, some of you are like this, and this is outside of God's standard, that's out of God's standard. And then he writes in verse 11, he writes this long list, and then he writes, some of you were once like that. So he's saying, hey, that big list I wrote, some of you are struggling with it, and some of you are, are now past it. But you were cleansed, you were made holy, you were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Here's what he's saying. Hey, the only difference between the people who are still doing this and the people who used to do this are those who called out to God and came clean to him. He he ultimately says that that's really the difference. There's no secret. God doesn't give some people the spiritual lottery and some others. He said, some of you have come clean and some of you haven't. And I love this term calling because it doesn't say have a long conversation. Some of us look at prayer like it's something we're dread. And this is calling just means, God, I've got to have you. I cannot do this myself. I am sick. I'm I'm not able to do this. I just want, just in this moment, God, I've got to have you. And the moment that you open yourself up to the Lord Jesus, immediately he puts you on the road to recovery. The moment you call on him is the moment the spirit of God starts to work in your life in any area of your life. Because you've come clean. See, for us, we have to realize this, that you cannot change yourself. You know what some people do? They call out to God on Sunday, and then they try to do it by their own power on Monday. And here's ultimately what he's saying is when you call out to God, the Spirit of God is going to start working in your life, and you need to rely on that. Because freedom is not found in willpower, it's found in God's power. And he says, hey, don't try to do this yourself. He said, open your, come clean. Tell God who you are, what you are, what you've done, and just say, God, I need you, and then trust in and follow the Holy Spirit's leading in your life. And what's the Holy Spirit going to lead you to do? Well, I'm glad you asked. Number two, he's going to lead you to cut it out. You're going to come clean, and immediately the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to cut it out. Do you know how my diets always get ruined? Almost universally. Do you know how my diets get ruined? Is on one aisle in the grocery store, the ice cream aisle. I mean, I can be doing great, but I go down the ice cream aisle, and and it's like, I cannot get past. I mean, if you, if I'm really trying to stay on a diet, I will, like, you'll see me in the ice cream aisle. You got to go past it. I'll, like, close my eyes and run with the buggy as quick as I can, you know, binding the devil and all of it to get past the ice cream aisle. Because here's what's true. I cannot connect myself to what I'm trying to conquer. I cannot connect myself to what I'm trying to conquer. That's called compromise, and compromise never leads to freedom. You, you cannot connect yourself to what you're trying to conquer. 
Jesus was asked about this. He said, Jesus, how much sin can we leave in our lives and, and, and have victory? How much sin can we leave in our lives? How many mistakes can we make? What, what should we do, Jesus? How would you handle this? Here's what Jesus said. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed, go through life maimed than with two hands, but go, but go to hell where the fire never goes out. He says, and if your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life crippled than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. Look, look what he goes on to say. He says, if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes. You know what Jesus is saying there? Don't miss this. He's saying if you can control what you do, hand, and if you can control where you go, foot, and if you can control what you see, eye, you can control sin in your life. He's saying if, you, if, you'll just, if, if you'll just take and control those things in your life, what you, go, what you do, where you go, and what you look at, you'll be able to control sin in your life. He says, you, you'll not fall into those pitfalls. Because here's what he's ultimately saying is that we all have a pattern. You have a pattern that always leads you to sin, just like I do. And your pattern is unique to you. It's, it has nothing to do with me. What makes you stumble doesn't make me stumble. What ends up you in, 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 in regretful decisions, don't, that's not the same for me. You better understand your pattern. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to stay out of the pitfalls that just keep happening again and again and again in your life. So if I was sitting across from you, here's what I'd tell you. First, you better understand physically what, when you're tempted and when you're not. Some of you, it's in the morning. Some of you, it's afternoon. Some of you are most tempted when everybody goes to bed and it's late at night. Some of you, you need to know when your blood sugar goes down, you make work, bad decisions. Some of you need, to, you need to recognize that when you've been on a business trip away from your spouse, you're more susceptible to this. Now, not only do you need to understand yourself, you need to understand the people around you. Because people that are in your life bring things out of your life. So you, you know what you need to understand is that when you hear that coworker make all that you know, talk and perversion all the time, that for him, whatever, he just says it, but for you, it gets logged in your mind and you start thinking about certain things. For, for some of you, you need to realize that though you're just having coffee with the, the girl across the street and she's telling you how great it is that she got divorced and she can do what she wants and be with whoever she wants at this point, and, and, and for you, you, you start thinking, what would life be like if I did that? You, you need to recognize that. You need to recognize that when you're standing beside him at the copier, that there are feelings that are coming about in your heart that you, you, need, to, you need to cut it out. Then Not only that, you need to know what places bring out in you. I'll give you an example. Like Places bring different things out of people, right? I mean, in here, uh, in this auditorium, man, it, it brings out the best in you. The parking lot, not so much, you know? I mean, it, it doesn't bring out the best in you. And you got to realize there are some places you don't need to go. There are some things that, bring, that they, just, they awaken this pattern that's in you and it leads you to, to the place you, you hate going, but you end up there every time. I just want to give it to you really practically. If cable causes you to have sexual mistakes, cut it out. If a computer causes you to have sexual mistakes, put it in a place where everybody has to see what you're looking at. If, if your smartphone causes you to end up in a place you regret, get a flip phone. If, if the gym causes you because you're around people who stray in your mind, then you just need to find a new place to work out. You, you say, well, that's kind of extreme. Well, how bad do you want to be free? That's the real question is how bad do you want to be free? Freedom is not convenient. It's worth having, but it's not convenient. You need to cut it out. Now, here's the number three. Connect with life-giving relationships. Now, I want you to get this. Most of you are not free because of this one. Most of you are not free because of this one. See, if the enemy can isolate us, he can assassinate us. That's just the way it always works in life. You were designed, literally, to need other people. That, that it's not just some people are people, people. No, every person was designed to need other people. That's the way you were designed. So when you don't have other people, life-giving relationships in your life, then you actually are, are, are going against your very design. And what you've got to realize is, is that, that there, you have to have some people who help you live your life. James 5.16 says it this way. Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 1 John 1, 9 says, confess your sins to God and you'll receive forgiveness. James says, confess to someone else and you'll be healed. There are a lot of people who are forgiven and not healed because they won't take this step. 
You see, secrets are the soil where sin grows. Secrets are the soil where sin grows. What, what, you, what you don't let anybody else know about your life, it's the very place that the enemy is allowed to do his work. Because in the dark is where sh- shame, condemnation, and guilt, he starts to grow those things. But the moment that you step into a relationship and, and, and in a life-giving way and you say, this is what I'm struggling with, immediately light is shed on that part of your life and sin loses its power. Confession is the only way sin loses its power in your life. It's the only way. And, and some of you are just bound because you, you won't live this out. And, and, and let me just say this to relieve some of you. It doesn't say confess your sins on Facebook. It also does not say confess your sins to each other so that you may gossip. It doesn't say confess them to each other so that they may critique you. You want to know how you found a life-giving relationship? When you confess to them, they pray for you. That's how you know that you've got somebody in your life that will connect with you, is that, that there's a response. When you confess, all of a sudden they pray. And that, that's the type of relationship you're looking for. And, and, and you know where you can find that? Life groups. This scripture, more than any other in all of the, the Bible, is the reason we do life groups. It is. It is because we know that people have to be healed. They're not just forgiven, but healed. And the only way to do that is to be in a meaningful, significant, life-giving relationship. And life groups allow us to do that. I have seen it again and again and again. You could, I mean, you could argue till you're blue in the face, and I wouldn't believe you because I've seen it too much. People who step into a life group, and then at first, they're, they're, everybody's just kind of, you know, it's like a junior high prom. Everybody's just, you know, real backward and everything. But eventually, about three or four weeks in, you're going to find somebody who says, hey, hey, can you guys pray for me? I'm struggling with fill in the blank. Hey, hey, I, I, can you guys keep me in prayer? I, I, me and my wife are blank. And, and I've seen it so many times. The moment they verbalize it, not before they pray, the moment they verbalize it, you see a weight come off of them. Like literally, shame and guilt, the, the heaviness, they just their shoulders straighten up because confession breaks the power of sin. And, and here's what happens is I've never once seen people go, I ain't sitting beside them anymore. Not once. I've never heard people say, can we kick them out of the group? What I've only ever seen again and again and again is people go, I struggle with that too. I've, I've seen other people say, you know, that was my life before Christ. I've seen immediately people pray, people apply God's grace. I have never, ever seen anyone reject it. I've only seen healing come from it because it's a promise of the Bible. And so, so can I just be honest with you? Until you get in a group, until you're willing to have this relationship happen in your life, you need some people who are cheering you on. You need some people that aren't, you got enough relationships that are pulling you in the wrong direction. You need some that are helping you towards God's freedom and his best for your life. Until some of you do this, you're not going to have the freedom you so desire. Now, here's the last one. Keep after God. Now, before I, I unpack this one, let us admire how I could do all C's and keep the sound without having another C to use. <laughs> Come clean, cut it out, connect with life giving relationships, and keep after God. I was proud of myself for that. I want you to hear this. It's not enough to run away from something. You have to run towards something. It's not enough for you to run away from your mistakes. You have to run towards something. There's a church that I, I've worked with over the years many, many times, and, and it's just a great church, not here in St. Louis, but I, you, know, you get to hear stories about what's going on there. I want to tell you about Jimmy and Leanne. Jimmy and Leanne uh, have been at the church now about two years, but when they first came in, they just appeared to be the perfect family. I mean, they're just this great-looking couple, and they got two little girls that are beautiful, great jobs, nice home. I mean, they just looked like I had it all together. No one knew what really was going on behind the scenes. Now, they just showed up for the first couple times, and, and they were pretty guarded, especially Jimmy. But eventually, after about a month, they decided to get in a group. Just honestly, not because they, they knew why a group existed. They just thought that's what you do at church. They were just kind of following the, uh, the announcements. And, and, and at the end of that semester, what people noticed is that Jimmy had changed a whole lot, that life had changed in him, and that he, he was more friendly. And he asked for a private meeting because he wanted to be baptized, and he wanted to talk to his pastor about what was going on in, in his life. And so he sat down at that private meeting, and he told his pastor, he said, I want to be baptized. I gave my life to Christ about a month ago, and, and, and I want to be baptized. But he said, you need to know what's been going on in my life. And he basically began to share that he had been in a downward spiral, at that point, they'd only been in the church about six months, and the only reason they showed up is because he said, I just wanted to see if God was real because I was getting ready to abandon my family. He went on to confess to his pastor that 
he had, he had two little girls. One was, uh, one was 10 months and one was three years old. And every time his wife had been pregnant, he had had an affair during that pregnancy with someone at his office. And he said that I was about to abandon my family for a third affair, and I thought, I'll give God one shot. And so we showed up on a Sunday. He described what he said, I had tried to stop. I didn't want it. I love my wife, but I just kept coming back to this. And so he said, I was just, I just, the only thing I knew was to run from it, and I was about to abandon my family. Now, he shared this with his pastor, and he said, we showed up the first week, and we were just kind of intrigued. He, 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 they didn't understand a lot, but they, they, there was something intriguing, and so they showed up the next week, and they showed up the next week, and they showed up the next week, and showed up the next week, and they just kept coming back because there was something intriguing, and, and they kind of just blindly went through it. They, they're not church folks, so they don't understand it, but they joined a group and served a team, and whatever they kind of asked from the stage, they just did because he, he said, you know, I, I just felt like if, if, if I'm giving God a shot, I'm going to give him uh, the shot, and so he said, you know, by the end of that semester, I was, you've asked me to read the Bible daily, I do. He said, you've asked me to, to join a group, I have. You've asked me to serve at some events, I have. I come to church regularly. And he said, about two months into doing all that, I, he said, I just recognized that God was filling everything that was empty in me. He said, I, 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 just, I realized that all of a sudden, things I had tried to fix my whole life, it was like God was making me into a new person. And, and here's ultimately what I would want you to get, because you wonder how these things are going to work out with a spouse, and when everything comes clean, and, and on the baptism day, Leanne said of Jimmy, knowing everything that had happened, she said, it's been easy to forgive him because he's not the same person. She said, he, God has so transformed him, that's not the husband I married, that's not the man who did those things, that, that, that isn't even the, 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 the father to the kids that we have. I mean, she was so overwhelmed, she said, how God's transformed him. But I just want you to see that that was not some swooping one-time wave of magic wand. He just kept showing up. And the more he filled his life with God, the less he needed in his life from, from what, what culture and his desires offered. The more that he just gave room to God, the, more and le the less he, he needed sin. And so if you don't hear anything, hear this. Do not miss this. Focus on loving God instead of leaving sin, and you will leave sin. Focus on loving God instead of leaving sin, and you'll leave sin. Because there will become a moment just like Jimmy had where you stop and say, you know what, I've tried to live the right way, I've tried to do everything, I've tried to keep the list, and it didn't work. But when you focus your eyes on Jesus and his love for you and his best for you, all of a sudden it's, it just becomes easier day by day as you keep showing up, putting more of his word, more of his presence in your life. You just keep showing up and you realize after a while you love him so much there's no way you would go back to that. That's ultimately what you've got to do because you can do all these other things and there will be moments, but if you want to sustain freedom, you keep after God. You don't let up. Don't just get freedom like it's something you purchased at a store. Get, get it. God will give it to you when you come clean, when you cut it out, when you, you get these relationships. But if you want to live free, the benefits of freedom, as that promise says, then you keep going after God. You fill your life with him instead of trying to empty yourself of other things. Now, here, here's what we're going to do. I've got a very very special prayer that I want to pray over you today. My heart is for people who need this today. So I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes, and I honestly just, just focus in on your life. What about today really stands out to you? Earlier in the services today, I gave people an opportunity to, to decide to begin to follow Christ. People who were not following Jesus. People who say, I've been doing it my way, and it may not even be about sexual immorality, or it might not be about sexual mistakes, but I've been trying to live my way, and it's not working. Today, I want to follow Jesus. If that's your decision today, already in services today, 10 people have decided to do that. But if that's your decision today, while every head is bowed and eyes closed, if you want God's way for the rest of your life, I, I just want you to raise your hand so I see who I'm praying with. If that's you today, I, Pastor Joe, will you pray with me? I see that hand. Who else? See that hand. Pastor Joe, will you pray with me today? See that hand. See that hand. Who else? Anybody else? Three people have made that decision today in this service. Anybody else? Today, I want to follow Jesus. All right, if you, if you raised your hand while everybody else is praying for you, I want you to look to the screen. There's a prayer there that I, I, I want you to pray with me. I just want you to pray as though God was sitting right in front of you. Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I'm lost without you. I believe Christ died in my place, making a way for us to have a relationship 
I choose to follow Jesus and his way for the rest of my life. Father, I pray you'd make them just like your word says, a new creation. Let guilt, condemnation, and shame come off of them. Let the love of God pour in. Let them sense a transformation in their life. Lord, I pray you'd bring people around them to encourage them and let them walk on this road to recovery in every area, God. Let them be transformed today in Jesus' name. And everybody says... Amen. Now, I don't want you to move because I want to pray over everyone here. But if you prayed that prayer with me, that you were one of those three or four people that raised your hands, take the card out that's in front of you. You see it on the screen right now. Take it out and fill it out because we want to help you. As a matter of fact, if you, you take and fill that out, take it to Connect Central in the lobby, we'll give you a brand new Bible today just to celebrate what God's doing in your life. Now, I'm going to ask that everyone stand to their feet and our prayer teams come forward at this time. Every person here today, stand to your feet and, and, and our prayer teams are coming forward. I, I'm going to pray for two groups, people who are struggling with past and people who are presently struggling. People who, who you'd say, man, I, I just, I need to live forgiven. I need to realize that. And then people would say, I need forgiveness. I need God to work in my life. He's got to do something in me today because I want to live free. I want to live the benefits of freedom. I'm going to pray over you, both of those. I, I just want, can everybody just, can you open your hands like this, just as a, a kind of an example of, God, I want to receive from you today. Holy Spirit, I pray right now, in the name of Jesus, every person here experience your best, the freedom that you offer and all its benefits. I pray for every person struggling in their mind, in their heart, with things that have happened in the past. Lord, there is therefore no more condemnation in Christ Jesus. So today, let that be released in their heart. Let them realize it in their mind. Give them a hunger for your word. Help give them an opportunity to share it with someone else. Lord, I pray today that they would leave with the weight pulled off of them, lightened by the load and the knowledge that you have forgiven them and there is nothing that can separate them from your love. Father, I pray today for people who are in a present struggle. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would free them. You said that if they'll know the truth, it'll set them free. They have seen your truth today. They have seen your word and the, the strings and the, the rope, the chain of the enemy are being detached from their heart in the name of Jesus. We declare the voice of the enemy to be silenced, his lies his condemnation, his guilt, and his rhetoric stopping now, and the love of God pouring in, them hearing your voice, seeing your word. Let every heart be so cleansed by your word today that it brings forth full fruit and ultimate freedom. Father, I pray today that you would help them to, to come clean, help them in this moment to cut whatever it is out, help them in this moment, Lord, to be honest. Some of them immediately, as soon as service is dismissed, need to sign up for a life group. Father, I pray today that you would get every one of us a hunger to chase after you and the more we have of you the less we'll need of what sin has offered us god we bless them today we thank you that they will live in freedom enjoy its benefits and live it with a sustained freedom never fading again in jesus name and everybody who receives it says amen amen thank you for joining us today we hope that this message was an encouragement to you to live a life fully devoted to god for more information about Twin Rivers Worship Center, or if you would like to partner with this church's ministry in St. Louis, Missouri and around the world by giving, visit us at our website at trwc.com. We would love for you to join us in a worship service at one of our two locations sometime. Have a great day and be blessed.